We're back with another installment of Real Talk with Tehran Poole, and we have a special guest with us here today, Tommaso Tesai. And I hope I said your name correctly. As I mentioned to you before, people butcher my name all the time, so I really try hard not to do the same to other people. But if I did butcher it, you can correct me once I'm finished. All right, Tommaso Tesai is an associate professor of religious studies at Duke Kunshan University. Before joining DKU, he was a Patricia Crona member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and a Polanski Research Fellow at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute in Jerusalem. His academic interests mostly center on the emergence of Islamic movement and faith tradition and on the consequential establishment of new religious and political authorities in the context of the late antique, uh, late antique um, Near East. His forthcoming monograph, monograph entitled The Syriac Legend of Alexander's Gate under contract with Oxford University Press examines a branch of apocalyptic traditions which are fundamental to understand the social and political setting from which the early Islamic community emerged and in which it shaped its identity. All right. And um, so what actually got you into this line of work? Um, I don't believe you're a Muslim yourself. Like I mentioned to another guest, you don't have to be to be interested in these type of things, but I'm always curious from uh, your, from the other person's perspective, what it is that got them into what they do. Oh yeah, well, it was a, it was a journey. I mean, it's funny because I usually tell this story to my students when, because I teach junior students who are about, usually about to explore their possibilities for the future. And so I tell how I reached to this point and um, I, first started studying Arabic at the university, and uh, it was not a very calculated choice, uh, to say the least. I just uh, uh, decided to explore something um, a bit different from what uh, I had studied at high school. Now, and, what were uh, you studying um, in high school, if you don't mind me asking, before you I went into Arabic? Well, uh, of course, I'm from Italy, so I had my high school uh, in uh, Rome, and I went to a, what we call a classical high school. So I had a more uh, kind of classical education, studying uh, Greek and Latin, um, together with other uh, uh, to, with uh, with other disciplines, of course. So and um, then uh, I started studying Arabic at the university, but uh, I did not really have an interest in. Uh, um, late antiquity or uh, medieval literature. It's something that uh, uh, developed over time. And uh, after uh, uh, graduating uh, the University of Sapienza in Rome, I moved to Paris uh, for uh, my master's. And there I started studying uh, 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 medieval Arabic literature. And uh, I got uh, completely fascinated by the character of Alexander the Great in uh, Iskandar in uh, medieval Arabic sources. So, and it was uh, following Alexander's steps uh, that I reached uh, to uh, the um, Surat, uh, Surat 18, Al-Kaf, uh, and the uh, Pericope on uh, Dulcar 9. From there, I started uh, my research on um, Quranic origins and the early Islam. So it was uh, uh, thanks to or because of Alexander that I reached to this point. And thanks to Alexander, it's what brought us together because that will be the topic of this discussion uh, today is the Syriac legend of Alexander, which I believe has uh, gathered a, a reasonable amount of heat, for lack of better words, over the last couple uh, weeks. So I believe this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, so what was it about Alexander that kind of, or at least from the Islamic perspective, what was it about Alexander that really sparked this interest in him to lead you to where you're at today? Was it anything specific, um, something specific that you read from a certain author, um, you know, anything of that sort? 
that's a, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know if I have an answer because I should uh, try to remember uh, the time when I was a student. You know, sometimes you just follow an interest without asking yourself uh, why you are so interested in this. I remember, I think it was when I was reading uh, the a passage from uh, Ali Dries's uh, book on uh, geography, and uh, I came across uh, this. Uh, uh, um, character that uh, whose name sounded uh, really curious to me, Dulcar 9. And uh, so um, the the two horned one, and uh, I was uh, there, who is this uh, this uh, figure? Who is this person? And uh, Ali Drizi uh, provided an explanation is uh, Iskandar. And uh, uh, then I started digging a little bit because I was very curious about uh, this uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, this uh, epithet of the Carnine, and I discovered all the um, question about uh, the um, relationship between the passage in the Quran and uh, these uh, uh, sources uh, about Alexander. So that was uh, my starting point. And uh, uh, up to that point, uh, I had uh, barely started uh, uh, questions uh, related to Quranic origins. So for me, it was uh, a real um, discovery uh, and also to some extent, a, a shock about uh, uh, learning of this scholarly de debate about the Quran, because especially if you are uh, uh, trained uh, in Arabic or Islamic studies, uh, what uh, you study about uh, early Islam and Quran is uh, uh, some kind of a standard narrative and uh, um, that uh, leaves a very little room for doubts uh, or for questions about uh, things that might have happened in that historical context. And, um, and uh, so it was a real discovery. I started uh, reading all the uh, debates that uh, were going on in uh, past decades. Uh, and I started reading uh, Patricia Crowe and John Wasbrook. And uh, I reached uh, to the um, contemporary uh, scholarly debates. And in the uh, next years, I had uh, the, uh, I was lucky enough to have the privilege to start. Uh, um, a direct conversation with many of the scholars uh, uh, whose work I had been uh, uh, reading up to that moment. Uh, speaking, um, since you mentioned Patricia Corona, I was wondering, did you have a chance to work alongside her while you were at Princeton? Uh, no, because unfortunately, when uh, I uh, was awarded this uh, uh, fellowship uh, membership at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study, uh, Patricia had already passed away. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to have the opportunity to uh, meet her uh, uh, a few years ago when I was a fellow in the Quran seminar project at Notre Dame. And I had uh, this very um, nice memory uh, uh, of uh, spending an entire afternoon uh, sitting in a cafe with uh, Patricia and uh, having a very uh, nice conversation. And we kept in touch in the coming months. So for sure, uh, uh, she's a big loss for, uh, for the field. Oh, definitely. And you know, she's kind of what, um, started me in this journey of, I would say, maybe looking at uh, Muslim history, Islamic history with the more critical eye. Um, the first book of hers that I read, or actually the first maybe academic study on Islam that I took seriously was Hagarism, even though I know it's outdated now, uh, now but just from the introduction, how she kind of laid out her intentions behind the book just captivated me. And yes, as I mentioned, it's probably outdated. Um, I still feel it was a necessary evil to bring us to where we're at today in Islamic studies, kind of just tearing down certain layers of things. So um, yeah, you're right. She is, it, it we have definitely suffered a great loss by uh, losing her. So, uh, but back to the Nishana, or actually I kind of gave out a little bit more than what I wanted to at first, but the Syriac, version of the romance of Alexander or the legends of Alexander is specifically called the Nishana. Um, 
one thing that I found interesting and I didn't know before is that there are actually different legends of Alexander. Previously, the way that people talk about it, it's almost like there's just one, but with a lot of different translations. Um, but doing a little bit of research, there are variations in each of these translations across cultures and region. The one that we're talking about specifically today is the Syriac version. So what is the Syriac legend of Alexander and what makes it more distinctive than other legends of Alexander found within the same genre? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this question. I think it's very important to start from there because uh, uh, it's a very complex matter, the that of the legends and the works uh, surrounding Alexander. And uh, there is also a lot of confusion uh, when uh, it comes uh, to the comparative analysis of the Dulcarnine pericope and uh, some uh, sources uh, uh, about Alexander. So we should uh, first uh, distinguish uh, between uh, the uh, our uh, main source of interest, uh, which is uh, uh, a Syriac work uh, that uh, whose original title uh, pronounced with an Italian accent uh, sounds uh, something like Nessana d'Alexandros, uh, which literally means uh, the uh, victory of Alexander. And it is uh, often uh, um, referred to in uh, scholarship as the Alexander legend or Christian Alexander legend. Uh, so uh, this uh, is uh, uh, a work that can be connected to a, a broader uh, universe of uh, traditions about Alexander that were circulating uh, since uh, uh, the Hellenistic period and in late antiquity. Now, at some point, uh, probably, uh, there is much debate about that, but uh, probably around the third or the fourth century uh, CE, uh, uh, some of these legends were uh, uh, gathered together in uh, uh, a work, uh, a Greek work uh, known as uh, the Alexander Romans, okay? So uh, the Alexander Romans and the Nesana are two completely different works, okay? The Alexander Romans uh, uh, became more uh, like uh, a, a cycle of legends and they, it was a work that, that was expanded, uh, translated uh, uh, several times. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I, th I think that uh, up to the point of the uh, translation of the Bible in modern language, the Alexander Romans was uh, the... Uh, work uh, most translated uh, in the Middle Ages. So we have- and You know, uh, I, uh, just to stop there, I found something very uh, recently, or not recently, but I had read that they had found a Al Hamiado version of pseudo Callisthenes in, the 19, in, 19, in Spain from the 19th century. So that just kind of shows how wide spread this literature was to make it all the way to Spain with crypto Muslims hiding it in uh, their house from the Inquisition. Yeah, it's a very it's a very complex uh, history of uh, tr transmission because uh, we have uh, different uh, recensions of the Greek Romans uh, and we have as many translations of these Romans. So we have Armenian translations, we have Syriac translations, then we have uh, Persian, uh, Farsi uh, uh, versions, uh, not translations. Uh, so uh, it's very complicated. And of course, uh, we uh, also have Arabic versions uh, that have been uh, recently uh, rediscovered. Uh, it was, uh, they were thought to be lost, but uh, they, uh, some versions of the Alexander Romans in Arabic have recently, to, uh, recently been found. Now, it's uh, extremely important to separate uh, the Alexander Romans uh, uh, of the so-called pseudo callisthenes from the Syriac Nesana. So uh, it is true that we have a Syriac version of the Alexander Romans. It is uh, not completely clear when it was composed, whether in the sixth or the seventh century, if it was uh, translated from uh, Greek uh, or if uh, it was translated from uh, uh, Middle Persian Pahlavi uh, uh, version. So there is a lot of debate about that. Uh, uh, the uh, Nesana d'Alexandros uh, uh, occurs, is found in the manuscript tradition, is transmitted as some kind of appendix uh, to the Syriac Alexander Romans, but they are two works completely uh, different. 
the uh, author of the Nessana might have been familiar with some of the uh, traditions that belong to the uh, literary universe of the Alexander Romans. But uh, uh, it's uh, uh, important to distinguish between the sources. It's a very common mistake to think that the episode of uh, Alexander's Gate in the Nessana comes from the Alexander Romans. Uh, it is rather the other way around. But uh, this is a very, um, this is maybe something uh, behind the scope of this uh, conversation we are having. Uh, what I wanted to um, emphasizes the distinction between uh, these uh, two works. Okay, so the romance of Alexander, the Syriac legend of Alexander, two completely separate works. They're not basically one in the same, where one is a Syriac translation and the others are translations into other languages, but um, the, the, the contents itself is different with, as you kind of touched on, but didn't want to go too much into that maybe the later romances might have taken aspects from the Syriac uh, mm -hmm. version of it. Okay, so- The Syriac, um, the Syriac Nesana, uh, the author of the Syriac Nesana might have taken some traditions that uh, uh, also occurred in early version of the uh, Alexander Romans. So it's a very, uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, narratological network of traditions. So, and sometimes it's not uh, always uh, easy to untangle <laughs> these, uh, <laughs> these connections. Okay, so what is the historical context by which the Nishana was, Nishana mm -hmm. was created? Uh, basically, what were the social, political, cultural, or economic situations that may have influenced its composition? Okay, so Let's say that, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, to understand that uh, uh, although the Nesana is, uh, uh, tells a story about Alexander, this is not uh, the historical Alexander, in so much as the Alexander of the Alexander Romans uh, is uh, uh, not uh, really the historical Alexander. This, uh, we are more in the, um, in the framework of uh, narratology of uh, stories. Uh, so that uh, are not uh, uh, really connected to history. They are inspired too, but uh, uh, it's more uh, like uh, legends, okay? So that does not mean that uh, the author of the Nesana uh, doesn't care about uh, uh, history. It's just that uh, he's not interested in the uh, history of the historical Alexander is in interested in the history uh, in its in his uh, own uh, historical context. So the if there is a um, uh, there many uh, scholars recently have accepted uh, a theory, uh, and uh, I include. Uh, uh, myself uh, um, uh, before starting writing my book uh, among uh, these uh, scholars uh, who em embrace this theory according to which uh, the Nesana was uh, composed um, uh, in the 30s of the 7th century to address uh, the uh, political circumstances of the war between uh, uh, Byzantium and the Sasanian Empire, and uh, um, in the end, uh, to, uh, the, with the aim of celebrating uh, Emperor Heraclius. Um, this is a theory that gained many uh, um, uh, consensus over the past decades and became uh, very influential. And I was also a partisan of this theory, if you want. Then uh, recently I had to reconsider my, my own position and uh, uh, this uh, I am now offering an alternative uh, view which is not completely new. It had already been uh, uh, offered uh, uh, by earlier scholars, uh, according to which the Nessana was composed uh, several, several decades earlier than what uh, many uh, scholars uh, um, maintain. And uh, uh, the historical context is that of the reign of uh, Justinian. So we are uh, in the middle of the sixth century. And um, it was uh, composed uh, um, uh, to address uh, a previous conflict. Uh, it was uh, the conflict that uh, uh, 
uh, opposed uh, Justinian to the Persian uh, uh, king uh, Hosro Anoshirvan. And uh, mm, the author of the Nesana uh, uses uh, uh, the figure of Alexander with a very specific political agenda. Uh, it is uh, basically um, uh, reshaping uh, uh, some kind of political trend in uh, Roman policy. The, it's the phenomenon of this uh, so-called imitatio Alexandri that had been cherished and pursued by some uh, Roman emperors uh, with the uh, intent of implying that a new Alexander will come to destroy Persia uh, once more. But uh, um, what is really peculiar to the Nessan is the way in which these previous trends are, uh, um, uh, are uh, refined uh, in a very peculiar uh, way. Uh, above all, we must see, say that Alexander here appears uh, as a, a Christian prophet. Uh, and this is the, uh, the first time that uh, we uh, witness this uh, metamorphosis of Alexander, who is uh, portrayed as a pious uh, king uh, who re receives the revelations by the Christian God and uh, who vows to uh, settle his uh, throne in Jerusalem to welcome the arrival of the Messiah. And, uh, uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, apocalyptic ideology uh, that is found uh, in this text. Uh, it's a, some kind of re-elaboration of ideas that were already been uh, um, propagated by another Syriac author, Afrahat, uh, back uh, in the fourth century. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, the uh, Christianized Roman Empire towards the end of times uh, will uh, defeat Persia once more and, uh, um, uh, and uh, it will uh, uh, establish a cosmocracy to welcome the arrival of the Messiah. And on the background of this ideology, there are, uh, uh, pro uh, there are uh, biblical prophecies, especially uh, the Danielic prophecies in Daniel. Now, in this uh, um, ideological framework uh, and historical framework, uh, there are uh, two more things uh, to be said that are relevant, very relevant for our uh, conversation today to understand the uh, origin of the, of the Dulcarnine pericope. First of all, uh, the author, uh, to pursue his uh, political and ideological agenda, uh, uses uh, previous traditions about Alexander, including the one about uh, uh, the Iron Gates that Alexander had allegedly built uh, in the Caucasus, uh, in an area uh, around modern Georgia, uh, I would say. So uh, these traditions are uh, well certified uh, since at least the time of uh, Josephus. So we are in the first century BCE. Of course, the historical Alexander probably never constructed any uh, iron gates and probably never reached to that area. But and that's what I read from um, Andrew Anderson Rooney has a really good paper on that subject talking about the historical Alexander versus the uh, Alexander of uh, Romance tradition. Yeah, is a that's a classical study. It's a bit outdated, but it's still one of the most uh, the best uh, investigated. So, yeah, it's dawning on a hundred years old, I believe. Uh, it came out nineteen twenty eight yeah. or nineteen thirty two or something yeah. like that. But that was my first introduction to comparing the historical Alexander to the one in the Romance, because I know that's where some people kind of get things mixed up. Like, okay, how could Dulcarnain be uh, Alexander when Dulcarnain in the Quran is very different than the Alexander of history. But a lot of people, they don't take into account that, okay, the Quran might not be making a play on the Alexander of history, but the Alexander of a literary genre. So- yeah. um, uh, Absolutely. And uh, we are, uh, you know, also with these uh, legends, uh, we are, we can be, almost sure that Alexander never reached to that area. But this is not really relevant for us. What is relevant is that the people believed that Alexander had arrived there and that he had established the iron gates to block uh, nomads from the other side of the Caucasus, okay? Um, so 
these uh, traditions are well certified. Uh, um, Jerome uh, in the fourth century uh, refers uh, to uh, this uh, uh, tradition. And uh, in uh, the sixth century, we have uh, uh, authors like uh, Byzantine authors like Procopius uh, and Jordanus uh, who refer to these uh, iron gates established by Alexander. So we are in the very same context of the uh, Syriac author of the Nesana. What is uh, new in the Nesana is uh, the way in which the story it is uh, is used. First of all, the reason, the purpose of uh, using this uh, uh, legend about Alexander. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it might be true that Alexander didn't establish any gate, but uh, historically we know that uh, in those uh, Caucasian passes, mountain passes, there were actual fortifications that were uh, identified with those uh, uh, of Alexander's in the legend. And uh, uh, these are the famous so-called the Caspian Gates. Now, these uh, Caspian Gates, uh, by the time our author was writing, had become a bone of contention between the Byzantines and the Persians, because uh, apparently the Persians uh, had uh, uh, managed to extend their control to those fortifications, uh, and they asked, demanded the Romans uh, to give them money for the defense of these passes. And if you read uh, uh, sixth century sources, you will find uh, an incredible amount of reference uh, to these Caspian Gates, because it was a very thorny political issues. The Persians uh, went as far as using it as a casus belli. The Romans refused to pay this uh, uh, money that the Persians were asking, and then the Persians would use it as a uh, reason to uh, start the war. Okay, and of course uh, there were mm, several implications. The Romans didn't want to pay money because this might uh, look like being uh, uh, subjugated to the payment of a tribute, and uh, so it was a very thorny political situation uh, issue. The Syriac author of the Nesana resumes this legend about Alexander, and what he wants to say is our ancestor, because in his ideology, Alexander is the uh, mythical founder of the Greco-Roman Empire, established these gates. So he wants to claim for the Roman Empire the role that the Persians are claiming for themselves. But it's not the only thing. He, he goes, uh, uh, he uses uh, this motif in an incredible uh, way. He's extremely skilled and he does a literary operation that he constantly does in his work. He takes uh, traditions from the uh, classical uh, Greek or Roman literature with which uh, he's uh, ostensibly familiar. And he reads these traditions at the light of uh, uh, biblical exegesis. So, the gate uh, uh, that Alexander allegedly built uh, to confine these uh, nomads from Central Asia becomes an, an, an eschatological portal. Why? Because uh, following a trend in exegesis, uh, he identifies the Huns on the other side of the Caucasus uh, with the uh, apocalyptic nations of Gog and Magog. Okay. okay? So this is, a, this is a, a crucial point. This is the first time that we have a source in which the gate built by Alexander has an eschatological function. In previous uh, references to the motif of Alexander's gate, there is no such a thing. And uh, one thing that uh, I uh, was uh, able to notice while doing my research uh, for my book is that there is uh, a very, if you want, a small innovation, but which is extremely significant. All previous sources refer to iron gates. In the Nesana, for the first time, we read that the gate edified by Alexander is made out of iron and bronze. And there is a very specific reason why the author introduces this new element. And this is the uh, symbolism uh, that you find in the Book of Daniel. According to the Syriac author, uh, the empire of Alexander is, uh, uh, a success, is uh, some kind of uh, 
blending, a mix, if you want, of the third and the fourth empires of world history, which in Daniel are represented by iron and bronze, respectively. Mm. So the gate forged by Alexander represents the role that this Greek or Roman empire uh, um, uh, founded by Alexander play in sacred history. And so this is a very important thing because we have a two significant developments. We have uh, uh, the gate that becomes a gate against Gog and Magog. And then we have a gate, an iron gate that becomes a gate of iron and bronze. Okay. So, and this is a one first relevant element. A second relevant element is uh, um, that of Alexander's horns. Okay. Uh, in the Syriac legend, we read that Alexander receives uh, horns from gold to gore, literally to pierce the other world kingdoms, okay? Now we are here facing the exact same literary uh, operation made uh, by the author uh, on the motif of Alexander's gate. References to the horns of Alexander are very, very well known. Okay, Alexander was uh, represented with a, a, a ram horns uh, of the uh, Greek Egyptian uh, gold uh, Zeus Ammon. Okay, and was this in his time that he was represented with two horns? Because I've heard debates about oh, uh, Alexander being represented with two horns is a uh, seventh century invention by Heraclius in order to kind of uh, promote and propagate um, a, a certain view. Uh, but basically that uh, the, the horns on Alexander is a later invention, or was it a contemporary to his time or happened shortly after? Well, first of all, no, it's uh, not uh, the first that uh, we have the first uh, representations uh, of uh, Alexander's horns on uh, coins uh, uh, minted uh, in the, um, uh, I think for the first time uh, in either Egypt or Thracia, but we are in the uh, reigns of uh, um, that followed the disgregation of Alexander's kingdom. So it's a very ancient, uh, um, symbolism applied to Alexander. And if we want to believe the witness of uh, some uh, uh, Greek author, Alexander himself uh, would uh, wear uh, uh, horns to appear like the uh, hair of uh, Zeus Amon. But again, uh, what is uh, uh, relevant is that these representations were for sure known during late antiquity, OK? Uh, and uh, our Syriac author was familiar with this kind of representations, but once again, he uses uh, these uh, 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 traditions, uh, visual or literary uh, traditions, uh, uh, but uh, he reads them at the light of biblical exegesis. In the Syriac work, uh, there are uh, at least uh, three references uh, to biblical passages. Uh, um, the most uh, uh, important of which uh, is a reference uh, to the uh, prophecy, the image uh, of the uh, ram and the he goat uh, in Daniel 8. And the uh, Syriac author does perform a very interesting uh, hermeneutic uh, operation in identifying Alexander not with the, with the he goat, but with the ram. Anyway, it's a very complex uh, topic. Uh, uh, I don't think we will have time to exploit it uh, entirely. But uh, the, uh, the important thing is that, uh, again, we, have, uh, we are facing a, a very precise uh, literary operation. Uh, there is uh, an element taken, uh, derived from the classical tradition, and read the light of biblical exegesis to address contemporary uh, political issues, because also the uh, way in which uh, uh, the author interprets the symbolism of Alexander's horns has an anti-Persian uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, so if you want, everything comes together. Alexander's, Alexander has uh, horns because he's a prophet and charged by gold and tasked by gold to uh, uh, defeat Persia. And the scenes uh, he is tasked by God is, is also the one who built the wall, uh, the gate against the Gog and Magog. 
but the last thing uh, then i will stop because i'm talking a lot okay this is the first uh, uh, source in which we find together the motif of a horned Alexander and that of the uh, wall uh, built against Gogonadog. And we have a few, if you want, pivotal elements that are really important to understand our uh, Quranic pericope on Dorkar 9. All right, so given the historical context uh, behind the composition of the Syriac legend of Alexander, it's safe to say that the production of this work was well received in its time, um, given all the things that were happening, uh, Heraclius' um, defeat of the Persians um, and, and stuff like that. So it was a very popular work. It wasn't like it went unnoticed. Um, it wasn't something that maybe someone found later on and it became popular then, but from its conception, it was something that kind of just took off in the in the uh, minds of people or late antiquity. Well, so I really don't want to overstate its importance because uh, it might sound like that I'm trying to promote the <laughs> <laughs> text that uh, I have been investigating uh, in the past almost, uh, I think, uh, well, 15 years. I think that's, uh, wow. or uh, I've been studying this text for at least 12 years. But uh, so there is always the risk to become a bit obsessive and to really overestimate the actual impact. But I, I am confident to say that uh, it was, uh, it uh, had the reception. And in fact, it's a uh, kind of uh, ironic to see that uh, uh, even it, if it went uh, mostly unnoticed in uh, modern scholarship, <laughs> during uh, in its uh, uh, historical context, it, received a considerable amount of attention because uh, if we wanted to make uh, just a very quick uh, calculation of the text uh, that uh, in, uh, are under the influence of this Nesana, uh, we have then this uh, sixth century Nesana. Then we have uh, an updated version because the Nesana was uh, uh, adapted to the time, uh, to the context and the time, uh, historical context of the reign of Heraclius. So there is, a, uh, it's not a huge uh, literary operation, it's just the interpolation of a sentence uh, and maybe the removal the, uh, of uh, uh, an episode. But uh, this shows at least that the work was received and somebody uh, living at the time of Heraclius while well, reading the story of Alexander and Benesana said, wow, we, listen, this is happening now. And so it was interpreted as some kind of foretelling, not the period of Justinian, but the period of uh, 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 Heraclius. So we have a Tunisana. Then we have a, a metrical homely, Syriac, uh, which is ascribed to ja Jacob of Serug, a sixth century Syriac poet, but that was uh, probably composed later. Now, also in this case, uh, many scholars believe that this uh, Syriac homily was uh, uh, written uh, uh, during the reign of Heraclius, and I disagree with this. I think that uh, I have reason to believe that uh, the homily was composed uh, somewhere around the end of the sixth century. So we have already three texts, and we have uh, an updated version of this uh, homily. At the 635 uh, version? Yes. The updated, exactly. okay. So, and this is uh, just the first layer of text that uh, are uh, under the influence of the Nesana. Then yeah, we have uh, another uh, Syriac uh, poem uh, uh, attributed to Ephraim, the so-called uh, Pseudo-Ephraim's homily. And then we have the uh, Apocalypse of the Pseudo-Methodius. Which I found uh, to be very interesting. I didn't have a chance to look into the contents, but just from what I understood of its content, it kind of does what the Syriac legend of Alexander does with the Justinian version, but kind of adapts it to its uh, period of time. So instead of the Central Asians being Gog and Magog, the Arab uh, invaders are Gog and Magog, if I understood it uh, correctly. Well, so first of all, this is a very typical phenomenon in apocalyptic text. Prophecies are re-updated 
to address uh, uh, new circumstances, uh, historical circumstances. That's why it's uh, very, very often it's so tricky to date them because there is a textual stratification and different textual uh, layers. In the case of uh, uh, this Nesana, uh, it was used uh, to address, uh, uh, first of all, it was understood as, addressed, as addressing new circumstances, okay? And then it was used by other authors to address other circumstances. Yep. Pseudo Ephraim uses the story of Alexander Gate as uh, mostly uh, as an element of uh, periodization of this catalogical time. So when the gate will be removed, uh, this uh, uh, apocalyptic process will start. But what is interesting in the pseudo Ephraim now is that the apocalyptic process also includes the uh, arrival of the sons of Ishmael, okay? And uh, we have the same in the pseudo Methodius. Another thing, another point of interest in the Nessana for these authors was the idea that no matter what uh, difficulties in the actual reality, the Roman Empire, the Christian Roman Empire will survive and in the end it will conquer the world. So this is a, 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 an element of interest in the Nessana for these authors who were witnessing uh, these new events, the empire was uh, suffering, and this uh, uh, was uh, some kind of reactions. You know, all this talk about the Nishana, uh, I think maybe we should start getting into the contents of it, uh, just Never. for people so they know exactly what is, what, uh, is being said in the work. Uh, so uh, how is the contents of the Nishana structured? Um, in, your, in your article, you have it broken down in like three parts, uh, but is that just how you kind of did it for uh, your academic work, or is that actually kind of how it's separated into three parts? Okay, good question. So first of all, that article is a bit uh, outdated. I mean, I still uh, um, think, uh, um, I still agree with myself of, uh, eight years ago, I would say with uh, some uh, uh, changes of mind. But anyway, I'm still, uh, uh, it's still a project for the future to write a new article or even uh, essay or short monograph on the topic. But it's get uh, a lot of publicity uh, being one of the few articles on the subject. Yeah, it, it was uh, very surprising because uh, uh, it was uh, published on uh, not very uh, well-known uh, journal. Uh, and uh, he, according to statistics on my academia.edu um, uh, website is uh, uh, the article that received uh, uh, most attention. So it was, uh, uh, it was quite surprising. Um, but um, so uh, I, in that article, I had divided the, the uh, narrative into three sections, uh, mostly uh, to distinguish uh, uh, among the different uh, traditions that the author used. Um, and uh, so we have the first uh, uh, section in which we read uh, Alexa of Alexander uh, declaring his intention to explore the world and to conquer all their kingdoms. Uh, he asks, uh, he summons uh, his, uh, the nobles of his kingdom, asking gather information about uh, 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 how the edges of the world uh, uh, are uh, structured. Then we have a prayer of Alexander to God, uh, in which uh, Alexander vows uh, to uh, submit uh, uh, the world uh, to welcome the Messiah. Uh, and then we read about uh, the Alexander's uh, travels at the edges of the world. Uh, this uh, is a very fascinating section because uh, we read a lot of cosmology, uh, a lot about how people uh, uh, imagine the world uh, to look like. Uh, and you and, have a uh, um, you have. I will plug this in the description. I, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to read it. The title is a bit, um, you know, maybe the title could have been a bit more clickbaity, but I didn't. But I didn't know it was actually talking about the very subject we're talking about now. I did see the cosmology, uh, Quran chapter 18, 60 to 65, but for some reason I didn't plug it into the interview that, or I didn't kind of connect it to the interview that I'm doing today. 
Well, it's a, I would say the, the topic is connected. It's uh, not uh, uh, exactly about the Nesana, but uh, it, it's also uh, related. But uh, anyway, this uh, first section of the Nesana is fascinating, uh, especially because uh, it uh, contains uh, some kind of reminiscences of very ancient uh, uh, legends, uh, uh, especially uh, about Gilgamesh. There is this... Um, hypothesis that at some point uh, the story of Gilgamesh uh, had been uh, uh, used to uh, um, formulate uh, uh, stories about Alexander and there are some kind of uh, uh, interesting reminiscences uh, uh, in the Nesana. Now uh, uh, from this uh, set of traditions uh, that uh, uh, find uh, parallels in several sources, uh, the Greek Alexander Romans, uh, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, Latin, Latin authors. Um, we pass uh, uh, to another set of traditions, and the, the passage is very clear. It's like as uh, if Alexander abandoned the, the uh, world of fantasy, in which uh, he uh, sees uh, the witnesses, the sun entering uh, a window in the heaven, and in which he reaches uh, uh, poisonous uh, uh, waters. And then he arrives uh, to a very specific and recognizable geographical area, which is that of uh, uh, the Caucasus. We are in the areas uh, of uh, uh, the so-called Dariali Pass uh, and in the area of uh, Roman Armenia. Uh, and uh, from uh, now on, uh, the uh, only traditions our author refers to are mostly uh, those uh, uh, that were believed to be more historical, like the one about uh, Alexander's gift. Okay. And then we have a, a section about this conflict between Alexander and the Persians. Of course, stories about the war of Alexander against Darius were very well known, but this, uh, this war uh, seen in the Nesana is very peculiar. It's really uh, a scene where uh, it's one of the first uh, uh, war I think you, you froze a bit. Ah, oh, so you just we... froze uh, for about two seconds. Okay, I'm back. So uh, I would think that uh, uh, the scene of uh, um, this uh, battle in the Nesana between Alexander and the Persians is uh, very unusual. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, uh, the sacralization of uh, warfare and the militarization of religion is a phenomenon that uh, had already been going on uh, from at least the Christianization of uh, the, the early Christianization of the Roman Empire. But uh, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of other uh, sources of the time in which you can literally read of God going to battle with a Christian army. And it's very interesting because uh, this is not something very usual in Syriac literature, uh, but you find some strong parallels in Armenian sources. So, and the fact that the, if you want the geopolitical interests of the author, uh, pivot around the uh, region of Roman Armenia and the Caucasus might be uh, telling us something about the author's origins. I mean, as you already mentioned, uh, a lot of the stories in the Nishana are a retrojection of contemporary events. Um, as you know, as you mentioned, Gog and Magog uh, is dealing with, uh, or I don't know, did you mention that Gog and Magog, the invasion actually is dealing with a, uh, what had happened in periods, uh, in times previous to the construction of, or the composition of the Nishana, uh, because I read that uh, there was a Central Asian invasion prior to the production of the Nishana. And that's actually what the Nishana is kind of touching on, uh, saying that it happened, um, kind of demonstrating that it happened before, or using that incident to show that it's a possibility that this could happen in the future. 
Well, it's a very interesting uh, question. First of all, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, nomadic uh, population from Central Asia uh, by that time had been identified with the biblical Gog and Magog. Okay, mm. we don't have any uh, um, source uh, claiming that uh, Alexander built uh, a gate to confine the biblical Gog and Magog and. Uh, I have, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my monograph, uh, I have reason to think that this operation was uh, made by the author of the Nessana himself. Now, the author acknowledges that uh, uh, these uh, Hans, among whose king, Gog, kings Gog and Magog are, are listed. So Gog and Magog in the Nessana are kings of the Hans. The author acknowledges that uh, invasions of these people already occurred, okay? And uh, sometimes it's evident that uh, he's a bit uh, uneasy with this because it's a bit like uh, claiming, is uh, uh, is on shaky grounds if you want, because it's like claiming that uh, Alex the magnificent Alexander's gate doesn't hold water. Okay, because you could say, well, you, uh, you built uh, this uh, incredible gate, but uh, uh, the hands can still come. But uh, the, uh, and the acknowledge that one recent uh, Hanik inv invasion already happened. It's that uh, of uh, uh, 521 uh, uh, by the uh, Sabir Hans. But what uh, is interesting uh, for the author is that uh, these invasions are only uh, a very pale reflect reflex of what uh, will happen at the uh, end of times. If uh, this uh, uh, final eschatological uh, uh, invasion doesn't occur now, it is because Alexander's gate is there, okay? Yeah, maybe some hands can still uh, make their way through it, but uh, there is still this uh, uh, eschatological portal which will be removed by God. Only God will remove the gate, and then the um, the final uh, the the eschatological process uh, will uh, will begin. And uh, that goes on to uh, the background behind the Quranic pericope of Dual Karnain, chapter eighteen, yeah. verses eighty three to one hundred two. The first thing that I would like to ask about that is where did you get the name? or where did you get the idea of using the term pericope from? Because it was the first time I've ever heard of it. Uh, and I actually liked using it and I use it a few times in my notes and even uh, what I plan to be the title of this discussion. Um, so what, what inspired you to use that, uh, that word? I know this might be kind of like a small point, but it's something that I've found I'm a bit curious about. I think that uh, the first, uh, because using pericope, uh, in this context, uh, referring uh, to a Quranic passage, uh, mm, I think uh, is uh, using uh, a terminology uh, that belongs mostly to biblical studies. Okay. And um, I think that the first time I heard uh, um, and I then um, taken <laughs> this use was by my colleague uh, Guillaume D who first uh, 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 spoke about the Dulcarnine pericope, and they found that this is uh, an accurate uh, definition. Okay, so according to Muslim sources, in what year was the Quranic pericope of Dulcarnine uh, revealed? I know they might have a, uh, well, I'll just let you go on and explain that. Okay, so uh, according to the uh, Islamic tradition, the Surat al uh, uh is a Meccan surah. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, must have been composed uh, sometimes uh, before the date of uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's migration uh, to, uh, to uh, Yathrib, Medina. So, uh, and this is why I think uh, uh, recent uh, scholarship on the relationship between the Quran and the Nesana attracted so much attention, because uh, the uh, if one accepts the working hypothesis that the Nesana was composed after 629, and if one accepts that this Syriac work inspired the uh, Quranic passage, then uh, we would have uh, 
some serious uh, consequences for uh, uh, the chronology of the Quran. A chronology that I should mention is not uh, um, in the Quran itself, okay? The chronology has been established by uh, the Muslim tradition or by Western scholars. Now, it's a very controversial issue. Uh, there have been uh, some uh, good progresses uh, in uh, trying to determine uh, a stylistic, a stylistic development in the uh, Quran and try to uh, establish some kind of chronology. Uh, I only partially agree with this uh, because uh, if it's true that in certain cases you can identify uh, some kind of um, uh, trend in the evolution of the style, there is a very problematic assumption. There are two problematic steps. First of all, that even if there is a chronological development, uh, we could still not uh, uh, relate uh, uh, with confidence uh, the layers to a specific historical context. Uh, so it's uh, even if we accept uh, a distinction between uh, uh, different uh, portions of the Quran and we place them on a uh, chronological uh, development scale, there is no reason to assume that this was composed in Mecca, Medina, uh, Rome or New York. I mean, it's just to say that we really, uh, it's very problematic to uh, find a point, a linking point uh, to uh, the historical reality. And then there is another very problematic aspect, uh, that of the single authorship of the text. Because, of course, uh, uh, establishing a, a chronology through uh, stylistic development implies that there is a single author. But this uh, is not uh, self-evident uh, to me. So anyway, I think that this is, uh, anyway, these complications are not uh, entirely um, problematic uh, for me. They are, but it really depends uh, on uh, what uh, we want to do with the relationship between the Quran and the Nesana. As I mentioned, uh, my recent uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, suggests that the Nesana was not composed uh, after 629. It was already uh, composed uh, in the middle of the sixth century. So in this case, the chronological factor might not be that problematic, although uh, my preliminary investigation, and I might still change my mind, but uh, the preliminary investigation I've done suggests that uh, the Quranic pericope most strictly adheres to the seventh century version of the Nesana than to what we can uh, reconstruct of the original version. It's a very um, complicated uh, philological analysis. Uh, it requires the uh, reconstruction of what the original version might have look, looked like. Uh, there are uh, in the Nesana, as it has been transmitted to us, uh, it is evident that uh, some passages have been erased, and that uh, the uh, these uh, um, these cuts, this erasement, uh, is reflected in the uh, narratological structure in the Quran. So the key there becomes to understand if these passages uh, had already been removed by the original author in the sixth century or if they were removed by the seventh century redactor. But at this stage, I don't really have uh, a, a, an answer, uh, a definitive answer, because I still haven't uh, uh, investigated the, the, uh, the question uh, to emit a final judgment. And uh, what are your thoughts on reasons for revealing the Quranic pericope of Dua Karnain, or as uh, Muslim tradition calls it, Azbab and Nizul? Um, mm. How much credence does that factor into uh, your research or work? Or being that it's of a <laughs> tradition, kind of can't really substantiate it with much, does it not factor into your research? Oh. 
I mean, uh, not really. I would say that that's a separate uh, research because uh, the as Baba Nuzul about the revelation of the Dulcarnine pericope are obviously um, not reliable. It's uh, something that uh, doesn't uh, preserve an historical memory. It's evident that uh, it's uh, pure speculation on the text. And it is very evident, for instance, uh, uh, when we read that, uh, because the, the 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 pericope is introduced by the standard formula, uh, y yes, aluna, an, and uh, so they ask you about, uh, and this is uh, a for formula that we find elsewhere in the Quran. And uh, when commentators read this uh, uh, formula, the follow up question was, okay, uh, who is? asking you about this Dulcar 9. And the answer they provide is that it's the Jews uh, in, uh, um, in Medina, in Mecca, no, in Mecca. The, uh, I think, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know if I recall it correctly, but I think it's a delegation of Jews coming from Medina to Mecca. Now, uh, the problem with this is that uh, when you read the Surat al kahf it's evident that uh, the background is a Christian background because uh, we are uh, uh, facing uh, narratives that were uh, um, uh, spread only among Christians. You have the story of the sleepers in the cave, uh, which is uh, a, an adaptation of the story of the sleepers, the seven sleepers of uh, Ephesus, which is a Christian story. Also then, uh, in Syriac, the Christian liturgical language. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And then you have also the story of Moses and the servant of gold. This is, uh, um, this is another Alexander legend readapted, but uh, it is uh, uh, um, combined with another legend that uh, um, the second part of that pericope with the famous uh, story of Moses following. Yep. The and we're actually going to talk about that, the, probably the last part of this, uh, towards the end of this interview, because that is something that totally blew my mind. Um, and a lot of people wrestle with that part of chapter 18 as well, the story of Moses and Kidder. Um, you know, you really can't take it as history, um, but, uh, you know, as, as a historical fact, you, you, it might have been, might not have been, who knows, but you could, uh, uh, just seeing how it, just just comparing it with uh, what you might find in uh, the Syriac legend of Alexander and other traditions with that uh, just totally blew my mind and that maybe it might have been a play on um, Alexander, the legend of Alexander, but kind of just switched the characters around uh, a well, bit. It's very it's a very complicated uh, relationship between these two stories, but first we should uh, say that the second part, the final part of that Moses story uh, about the uh, travel of uh, uh, Moses with the servant that he needs at the Majma al Bahrain, uh, it has nothing to do with the Alexander legends. It's some kind of uh, new narrative tradition uh, mixed with the Alexander tradition. Mm. However, this story has a very close parallel in uh, the work of a, a Christian uh, writer uh, called uh, John Moscos. Okay, and they, there we read about uh, a hermit meeting uh, a, an angel with a hermit uh, performing uh, the deeds of Moses and the, the angels, the deeds of the servant of God. So it's again a Christian narrative, and then that of uh, Dulcar 9 reflects the uh, Alexander legend spread among Christians. So if you read the Surah, it's entirely a Christian. It has entirely Christian background. So as Baba Nuzul uh, uh, connected this uh, to uh, Jewish traditions are not reliable. Um, as for what you were say, saying, the Moses uh, pericope, uh, that's uh, fascinating. It requires uh, a lot of investigation. The first five verses are surely inspired by the story of Moses, uh, by the story of Alexander. It's evident it's a very um, peculiar and unique uh, uh, narrative uh, uh, motif about the resurrection of a fish. You find this in the Alexander traditions. 
it's not unusual uh, uh, that uh, uh, legends uh, or uh, stories, uh, tales, uh, call them uh, uh, however you want, uh, attributed to uh, a character uh, are used uh, in relation to another character. And we don't have much left. Just uh, thank you for your time. And I hope it hasn't been, you know, too much of a uh, it's too, too too difficult to get through my line of questioning. Hopefully, I wasn't asking any kind of elementary school uh, questioning or questions. But uh, I am curious. The majority of classical Muslim scholars believe Dulkarnain to be Alexander. Uh, this is a fact; nobody can deny it. But did they have any knowledge of the Nasana? I mean, do you know how early Muslim scholars arrived at associating Dulkarnain with Alexander? And does the Nasana have anything to do with shaping that conclusion on their part? Okay, so this is an excellent question, and uh, uh, this is uh, an area that requires uh, so much investigation. Because, uh, for instance, uh, I have no doubt that uh, Vulcar 9 is Alexander, but not the historical Alexander. Vulcar 9 is a, a, a reflex of the Alexander of the Nessana, that is, an Alexander who is a prophet an Alexander who has uh, horns uh, uh, provided by God, okay? So uh, first, uh, uh, commentators, uh, as far as I could uh, uh, see, uh, had really no doubts in identif identifying Dulcar 9 with Alexander, okay? Doubts uh, uh, emerged uh, uh, later in very, complex uh, circumstances. Uh, we have uh, uh, different factors uh, that uh, uh, brought uh, uh, to a separation between uh, uh, Vulcan 9 and Alexander. Um, as for the knowledge and the reception of the Nessana uh, in the uh, post-Islamic period or post-Quranic period, uh, to use a better uh, term of uh, chronological reference for us, uh, Kevin Van Bladel uh, has uh, uh, pointed out some uh, elements uh, uh, of the Nessana used uh, by some uh, uh, Arab historians. And uh, we know that the Nessana, a version of the Nessana, uh, uh, was uh, uh, um, translated into Arabic. Uh, it, it's it's fascinating because uh, it's not really a translation. It's a, a Arabic story of Alexander that uh, uh, ostensibly draws from the Nessana, but also from the Quranic uh, passage. And then uh, these uh, stories uh, uh, later uh, uh, reemerge in Ethiopic versions of the stories of Alexander that were translated uh, uh, through Arabic intermediaries. Okay, so that's how the Ethiopian version made it to that region. Uh, it was translated from the Syriac. It wasn't like um, it existed before the Syriac, but that's where it, it had got it from. Well, uh, for sure, this is uh, really not uh, uh, within my area of research because uh, I explored uh, mostly the phenomenon in late antiquity and uh, I didn't really follow Alexander in uh, later uh, periods, Maybe. but uh, as far as I know, Syriac sources uh, about Alexander, including the Nessana, uh, provided the substantial materials for uh, Arabic uh, stories about Alexander, and these Arabic stories were translated into, uh, into uh, Gez. Okay, and this is, uh, I, uh, there's a few people I would like to touch on. Budge, I'm just using his last name, Noldika, and as you mentioned already, Van Bledel. Uh, these three men uh, made significant contributions to understanding um, um, the dual Karnain, or the Quranic pericope of dual Karnain, Budge being the one to translate the Syriac legend of Alexander. Uh, then a year later, um, in 1890, Noldika. Um, discovers uh, correspondence between the Nisana and the Quranic Pericope. And as you mentioned in your article, his theory lay dormant for quite some time until it reaches uh, Kevin Van Bledel um, in uh, the late uh, 2010s, I think 2007 or 2008, something like that. And that's when you see a reemergence of uh, the theory of, of, of Noldica. 
Um, but well, previous, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I would say that uh, absolutely. I mean, Nordeke uh, already pointed out the textual uh, link between uh, the uh, Dulcar 9 pericope and the Nessana, and incredibly, this was uh, completely uh, neglected for uh, several decades. It was only recently uh, that uh, Kevin Van Bladel uh, reassumed uh, this uh, um, uh, theory and he wrote a very strong uh, article in support. Although uh, I don't, uh, uh, I, I think it must be reanalyzed at the light of what uh, I could uh, find uh, uh, about the Nessana. Now, there is also another thing that uh, should be added. To uh, that discussion, I started to introduce these elements in that uh, old article that I published in 2013, and I hope that uh, I will write more in the future. There are a few myths to um, dismantle, uh, no, uh, because uh, uh, Van Bladel's article uh, found some pushbacks recently, uh, which are not uh, completely fair and are not uh, uh, completely well uh, uh, structured. So we need, uh, first of all, uh, to um, uh, point out that uh, the relationship between the Dulcarna Empericopy and the Nessana is not uh, only a superficial reference to a common theme. Okay, the two uh, texts uh, share much more than that. And that, that. You're going on to my next question. So this is a uh, perfect. <laughs> okay, so first of all, the Durkar 9 pericope reflects the way the Syriac author has combined together previous traditions. It's true that individually these traditions pre-existed, but the way in which they are combined together uh, is uh, uh, certified for the first time in the Nessana. The Syriac author, uh, let's say, uh, put uh, took A, B, C that were around there and he put them in this specific order. And if you want, uh, he, he did A, B, C, E uh, and A, B, C, E, G because he excluded some traditions. So not only D, D, put together traditions that were not connected to one another, he also excluded some episodes. It's a huge editorial work, if you want, and this editorial work is reflected in the Quran. So it's not only a superficial general reference, like, I don't know, uh, the story of uh, uh, the, mm, uh, the uh, references to Jesus that you can say yes, but uh, these stories about uh, uh, Jesus were everywhere uh, uh, in late antiquity. There we have a, a real textual network in the way the traditions are put together. And even if we focus on the uh, specific element of uh, Alexander's Gate, which is the one that always catch the eye, nobody uh, uh, spends too much time uh, looking at the structure of the general pericope. It's only about uh, the Alexander's Gate. Uh, a, a pushback that I often heard is that, yeah, but these traditions about Alexander's uh, Gate must, must have been very popular. And the answer is no. I mean, we know that there were traditions about Alexander building iron gates. We don't uh, have any proof that there were traditions about Alexander building an eschatological gate, and Alexander, a horned Alexander building an eschatological gate made of iron and bronze. So this is this unique is the, to the Syriac version. This is unique to the Syriac. There is a very specific reason why in the Syriac work it is that way, because this reflects the ideology of the author, and this is reflected in the Quran. Seeing that uh, uh, these, uh, the, uh, the Durkarnan uh, pericope is referring to very ancient and very known uh, traditions about Alexander that were ex ex exceedingly common as the same uh, value than same blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it, it's really, uh, it has no proof, uh, no certification. So there is, a, a, if one is in good faith, can, cannot deny the um, uh, uh, relationship between the two texts. 
And I did want to touch on, or so basically you're saying that the um, similarities, li the literary similarities are too strong to say that maybe the Quran drew this from a pre-existing tradition outside of the Nisana. And similarly, the philological sim similarities are way too strong to say that it yeah. possibly got it from um, a common source with the Nisana. I mean, you know, for instance, there, there are some uh, recently published uh, uh, academic works that uh, try to separate the two uh, uh, texts, uh, pointing out uh, some uh, um, textual instances where uh, there is uh, not uh, an extremely close connection. Uh, the problem is that uh, these are uh, really marginal details. I will give you uh, an example, uh, saying that uh, the uh, Nesana and the Quran are not related because in the Nesana, Alexander uh, encounters uh, a, uh, um, some fetid water, poisonous water, whereas in the Quran, uh, the Quran finds some boiling water. And saying that there is a difference there, to me, sounds really uh, like uh, dragging the situation a bit uh, too far from reality. Um, because uh, overall the correspondences are so strict, uh, we need we need uh, to clarify what situation we're talking about. So if we want, if by saying that the Nisan is the source of the Quran, we imagine a situation in which there is an author sitting at the desk with the Nisan at his left and the Syriac Arabic dictionary at his right, and the translating the Syriac into Arabic, we can say no. It didn't go that way, okay? If we want to imagine that this Syriac text gave rise to some uh, new literary trends about Alexander and that, this, uh, that the Quranic pericope participates into this small uh, Alexander Renaissance or this small literary revolution, we are closer to the reality. And uh, it's extremely interesting. Again, uh, this I'm uh, um, at a very early stage of my investigation of this uh, question. But uh, in the Quran, we find uh, some kind of elements that are not found in the Nesana, but that are found in sources inspired by the Nesana. For instance, uh, when, Mimra or the the, the Syriac or the homily pseudo Ephraim uh, and pseudo Methodius in particular. Mm -hmm. I will give you an, exa an example. When uh, the uh, Quran says that the Gog and Magog will uh, raise like uh, waves, okay, uh, the verb uh, the Quran use. Uh, I don't have the text under my eyes. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I don't remember, but I'm trying to remember too. I think Van Bladell had it in his article. Yes, uh, but uh, what uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, Kevin uh, related the, the the verb to a prophecy about Jesus in Luke, and I don't think that this is the case because in the Quran that specific uh, verb uh, is used to uh, describe the waves uh, uh, in the story of Noah's ark. And the, the image of the waves in Noah's time and the deluge is used to describe the Gog and Magog arrival in the pseudo Ephraim. So again, we have a Syriac text that becomes somehow influential, and the Nesana is part of this literary universe influenced by this text. But it's not a translation from Syriac into Arabic. It's an adaptation, if you want. OK. Uh, and just my last two set of questions, um, the real the, the re-elaboration of previous and contemporary traditions. You touched on it a bit, but just to kind of unpack it a little bit more, um, there are elements from previous traditions present in the Syriac legend of Alexander, as you've already mentioned. Um, and one of them that I found to be the most interesting, like as I already said, uh, is the Mimra or the Syriac uh, metrical homily, the poem. Um, and it's the um, and in that you have the episode of the quest for the water of life. Mm -hmm. And in the Quranic pericope, 
of Moses and al Kidder, you see something that is akin to the quest for the water of life um, mentioned in the, uh, it's not in the Syriac legend of Alexander, correct, but it's in the, the, the Mimra. Um, yes. So that just makes me, leads me to, I mean, like how did, how, how do the Quranic pericope share this with the Mimra when the Mimra came and uh, was possibly created in 635? Um, you, all, you mentioned that there might've been uh, in your article, and I know you said it's outdated and you don't kind of hold to this hypothesis anymore, but possibly a vorlage that mm -hmm. um, the way that you had it constructed was uh, there was a vorlage text, there was the Syriac legend of Alexander, and then there was the Mimra, and mm -hmm. that the Quran possibly uh, took from the, uh, the Syriac legend. But in this hypothesis, you didn't have the Mimra linking to the Quran. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering how, how, how did that association come about? Okay, so it's it's a very complicated uh, relationship. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, um, talking about that article, what in that article I had uh, named the hypothetical vorlage, now I would name the original Nesana, because now I know that there was a Nesana before the Nesana, so a sixth century Nesana. Now, um, we, we need to clarify a few things uh, to just to point out how complicated the situation is. It's true that there is a story of uh, the water of life uh, in the Quranic pericope immediately preceding the Dulcar 9th one. And it's true that there is a, a water of life story in the Mimra, uh, the metrical only. However, when you compare them to one another, uh, you realize that uh, these uh, are two different versions of the same story and that the version in the Quran is not, uh, the, cannot, if you want, be derived from the one in the Mimro because the version in the Quran is uh, much more similar to the uh, oldest one that we find in the Alexander Romans. Uh, okay. Just to enter into the details, uh, in the uh, Alexander Romans, Alexander asks uh, uh, his uh, cook to uh, uh, prepare a, a meal. The cook washes a fish into a water course. The fish comes back to life, and this is the water of life. It's something that happens by accident. Mm -hmm. And in the Quran, it's the same. Moses asks the valet to uh, cook something, the fish escapes, and uh, so it's the very same dynamic. In the Mimro, it's completely different. It's an intentional quest. Alexander orders his cook to make a test, take a dried fish, and you wash it in every water course that you find, because I want to find the water of life. So these are two different uh, versions of the story. And the, the Syriac version is different from the one that we find in the Quran. So it's a very complicated uh, uh, textual network, uh, which I'm trying to figure out okay. in this moment. What no, is the, uh, oh, sorry. What no, no, go the, ahead, go ahead. What is uh, important is that uh, I have reason to believe that the original Nesana included a version of the story of life, but it was removed. And then the issue is to, be, to understand if uh, the presence of this story in the Mimro is because the Mimro preserves uh, a more original version of what the uh, structure, the textual structure looked like, or if it was reintroduced. And, uh, uh, and this has uh, some considerable uh, uh, consequences to understand the uh, structure of this Rebel Cup. But uh, again, I am still the early stage of the investigation. Okay, but it seems like at this point, all things considered, um, you really it, it's not enough of sim not enough similarities to really say that the pericope, the Quranic pericope of Moses and Al Kidder, uh, took from the Mimra, uh, no, being no. the nature. Okay, and this I, is my last. No, I, I would exclude it. Okay, what and it this is my last us, question. Uh, 
sorry, this is uh, something that uh, I want to add. What it tells us is that uh, their, uh, the author or the authors of that Quranic Surah were aware that the two stories of uh, the water of life and of Alexander's wall or gate were somehow related to one another, or at least that uh, another author, a Syriac author, perceived uh, these two stories uh, uh, the same way, as something that must be put together in the same text. Okay, and this is my last question. Uh, what are your thoughts on, or what are your thoughts for those or to those, what do you have to say about people who believe Dual Carnain is Cyrus the Great, not Alexander? The not Alexander. What what do you believe? There's any credence to that? I mean, uh, is that on shaky ground or is it on no ground? Uh, just from um, your perspective as a scholar who's researched the subject for the last 15 to 12 years, how uh, what what are your thoughts on that assertion? Well, first of all, one thing that we need to clarify is that, uh, at least uh, from my perspective, here we are not talking about uh, historical figures. We are talking about, uh, uh, if you want, fictional characters that, of course, uh, originate uh, in history. But uh, already the Alexander of the Nesana is not the historical Alexander. Uh, now, my, it is my conviction that uh, Zulkarnain in the Quran is uh, a character that reflects uh, the Syriac Alexander in the Nesana. At the same time, the Syriac Alexander in the Nesana somehow incorporates uh, traits that other traditions attribute to Cyrus, if you want. But uh, mm, if you uh, read uh, uh, about uh, the who Dulcarnain is, I have uh, um, this, uh, it, it's more a hobby for me uh, to, to read uh, these uh, debates. And uh, I, I see there have been the, more, uh, the most different uh, explanations. Uh, of course, uh, he's, uh, he's Alexander, he's Moses, He's uh, Cyrus. I even read uh, no. He's uh, uh, Nabucodon. No, it's uh, Hammurabi. So uh, there are uh, all attempts, uh, all kind of attempts uh, to find the historical figure behind. But uh, my point is that this uh, story of uh, Dulcarnain. I mean, the ancient, why the Quran uh, includes this story? The Quran is not uh, uh, a book of history. It's not uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, tell the reader about how things went at the time of Dulcarnain. It's they, not doing the work of a historian. No, it's uh, the only interest that the Quran ostensibly has in this story is just to make the point that at some point, the end will come. Mm. And I will give you an evidence for that. God will remove the gate that Zulkarnain built. Okay, But the only message that the Quran wants to communicate is be aware, because the end will come, and then there will be rewards and punishments. I don't think that uh, the original author of this pericope had any interest in uh, uh, making uh, some kind of lesson of uh, history. In so much as the author of the Nesana really couldn't care the less about the historicity uh, of uh, uh, his Alexander story. He, he probably was very well aware that uh, these things never happened. What he's doing is trying to uh, convey a message. And I think that uh, uh, with the Quran is the same. Okay, thank you for that, uh, because I guess the, one of the problems I ran into early on looking into this was um, I just could not believe that it was Alexander, but I was looking at it from a historical point of view and just trying to, just looking at taking it, uh, going in that direction with it, I was compelled to believe 
that it was Cyrus the Great. And I started looking into Cyropedia by Xenophon, trying to find evidence of dual card name, reading Herodotus, what he said about the Persians and Cyrus. And, you know, you really don't come to any definite conclusion. It's only, uh, just from my opinion, it's only when looking at dual card name through the lens of the Alexander, uh, the Syriac legend of Alexander tradition that you kind of actually come to, I believe, better conclusions. So I greatly appreciate um, you taking the time to speak with me about this subject. And I am very much excited to, or can't wait for uh, your recent pub or your latest, or what will be your latest publication on uh, this subject. Uh, is there anything you can share with us about how that's going? Uh, anything to look out for places we can, uh, somewhere we can find uh, more of your work, of course, academia edu that I'll put in the description, but you know, places that I might not have been aware of. Oh, uh, I don't think so because uh, you know, over the past few years, I dedicated most of my efforts uh, to uh, finish this book. In this moment, is uh, it's uh, under review. Uh, hopefully, uh, it will be published. Um, not too far in the future um that's the first uh, step but uh, i can't uh, make any commitment about uh, when i will publish something new about uh, uh, the relationship uh, between uh, nesana and uh, vulcar 9 pericope it's a project for the future uh, but uh, uh, i don't know i um, constantly uh, get sometimes i get lost following alexander and uh, it takes me time to come back uh, on my original purposes. Well, I'm definitely excited and I can't wait for the publication to come out and I'll be looking out for it. And maybe we can get an exclusive uh, interview here on this channel concerning your work um, after it's uh, printed. So, um, Tomas, Tom can you say your name for the audience? Yes, of course, Tomaso. Tomaso, last name, Tessai. Tessai. Okay, it's a real slick name, and I just wanted to get it correct. <laughs> My wife, because uh, she um, teaches English as a second language, she's really much into uh, different languages. Uh, when I told her your name, she assumed uh, it was Eastern European, but I was like, nah, uh, he went to school in Rome, so I think he might be uh, Italian. So there was a bit of a debate, but you know, where, uh, where you were from based off of uh, your name, so. I, I was originally from, uh, from Rome, Italy, but I, oh, I okay. have, uh, been living abroad uh, uh, for uh, many years now. Okay. Do you have any plans of going back to Rome or that ship has sailed? Uh, who knows? I mean, maybe in the future. I, uh, for now, I, I enjoy my, my position in China and uh, I don't plan to leave in the immediate future. Okay. Yeah, I myself, I've been on the road since, or I've been away from home since 19. So, and I pretty much don't have any plans of going back uh, except for to visit and, you know, see my family and friends and stuff like that. So uh, I'm not gonna hold you up any longer. I know this kind of went a little bit longer than I had planned or we had specified. So um, I will let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. It looks like it's sunny there in China. Uh, we don't get much sun in the UK, but today uh, it's definitely shining down on us. So I'm hoping to take advantage. Okay, enjoy. All right, I will. Thank you again and hope to speak Thank to you. Thank you for again. inviting me. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Bye. Bye.